or those who are interested in the research. Um, as the ETA, we are part of the um, Transregio, it's a, it's a um, DFG funded um, collaborative research center on additive manufacturing in, in construction, uh, which we are um, running together with um, TU München and um, where we investigate several additive manufacturing processes on the scale of construction, as well as um, develop materials and processes and um, design and construction procedures. So um, we have a website uh, which is depicted on the lower right corner. And if you're interested, um, you are invited to um, visit this website and contact us um, if you are interested in collaborations or so. And with that, I thank you for your attention and I'm also welcoming questions from your side. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much, Norman, for this impressive talk. Um, it's always great to see the scale in which you operate in Zurich, uh, but also now in, in Braunschweig. Um, and I guess that's, that's uh, an important thing to really go one-to-one. -one. What are your thoughts on that? You, you started small scale. We saw that in the, in the first experiments with the plastic extrusion. Now, now it's real architectural scale. What does it take to go from model into one-to-one? -one? Yeah, I mean, many of these things are, um, you can really test it only on one-to-one -one scale, but of course, this is also always a tremendous effort that you have to take in terms of materials and labor that is involved in these um, in these large scale experiments. So um, many of the things uh, that we are testing, we are actually um, kind of glad to test it at small scale first and as much as it's possible. So um, of course, certain things do not scale very well. Um, others do, for example, um, we can, um, investigate uh, how to reinforcement can be placed and in a manual process or pick and place process and so on. So whatever is possible for, for, for the sake of um, um, being able to work with lean teams, um, we try to um, do on the, on the small, smaller scale and then eventually um, test it up to actually verify um, that these assumptions um, are correct. Um, yeah, so for example, we are currently um, sc actually scaling down again um, the, the shotcrete process. As I mentioned, we mostly takes um, seven to eight people to, to, to operate an experiment. And we're now looking into how can we make it as small as possible so that we can, um, so that we can have um, valid um, uh, or verify research assumptions also on the smaller scale. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have questions in the chat, Philip. Yes, I have two questions to add. Mm -hmm. The first one is what kind of tools are used for smoothing and cutting? Yeah, um, so uh, dif different ones basically. So for smoothing, we used um, uh, off the shelf products from uh, Rockamat, it's a firm that um, builds these handheld devices for um, cement plaster. And these are basically simple, um, or there's a range of products um, from uh, plastic discs to um, steel discs, or um, these, I, I don't even know the name for it, um, these um, rotating blades, um, um, Flügelglätter in German, um, uh, that I usually use to, um, to smoothen uh, floors. And then for um, the milling part, we looked for, there are not so many um, devices that are actually used for um, cutting wet or like green state concrete. And um, there we just um, looked into um, milling bits, flank milling bits um, from, uh, that are usually used in, for other purposes. But now we are developing our own tools to, to, to be more precise um, or to meet more precisely the requirements um, of the processes. Okay, thank you. 
-hmm. And then the other question was, what kind of sensors are used for the distance measurements or what is done with a visible laser? Yeah, exactly. Um, so it's a, it's a simple laser measure, um, uh, laser measure. Um, it's a line laser scanner. Um, and it measures basically just the distance from the nozzle to the, um, to the deposited material down below uh, to, the, um, to the layer. And uh, we use it um, in a, in a uh, feedback loop. So if the distance changes, so if the distance becomes too big, we, we slow down the robot so that more material is deposited. And if the distance becomes too small, we speed up the robot so um, that less material is deposited. And this way, um, and in this way, we, we simply try to keep the distance, the pre-calculated distance from the robot nozzle to the um, deposited material always constant because then we know that we are at the, at the exact height. And this can be um, very um, conveniently um, um, be adapted by uh, or um, adjusted by the robot speed. All right, thank you. These were the questions to Norman from the chat. Thank you, Philip. Um, you intentionally excluded the WAM aspect uh, in your talk. However, maybe Heis, do you have any thoughts uh, on how that uh, could be combined from your point of view? Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I was uh, glad to see uh, the project uh, um, proposal a couple months ago. Maybe it was there out there longer, but uh, it looked really nice. Um, I think we never really dove into it because we always feared that uh, uh, the printing of the lines is, is a bit too slow. Uh, I wonder what, what your take on that is. So we, we print uh, in, in a good day, we can print something like two meters, maybe two and a half meters per hour of, of uh, line. And um, yeah, I, I would say that slows down uh, the concrete deposition uh, quite a bit. Yeah, that's actually the, um, the main issue with it. Uh, I think these uh, two processes operate on different speeds. Um, uh, one possible way or an approach that I've seen lately in a publication from, um, I don't want to say anything wrong yet, I don't know actually who published it, but it was kind of a, um, an abstraction of the one um, welding process uh, where, um, where it's more kind of a stud welding process, mm -hmm. so where you take discrete elements and weld them together so that you can create height at, 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 at um, higher speeds, um, which could be a, a valid solution um, to, to in increase the building rate of the steel. Yeah, yeah. so if you see the ETH uh, project where, uh, where you put down uh, a rebar like this and you put another robot that uh, yeah. puts down the dot, uh, I would say uh, you, can, you can win, maybe you put down another 30 centimeters each time uh, with uh, yeah, in in a like a twenty second uh, motion. So that that sounds like uh, the the speed uh, that you need. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm curious. I mean, uh, also you know I, I I do see the benefit of a, a fully printed uh, rebar uh, because then you can go all organic and and that would be really nice to see. Uh, maybe even you know you can you can uh, print uh, the the. Um, the concrete uh, outer shell, um, so that uh, so that you can also keep the concrete in a, in a very um, organic shape. But uh, um, yeah, it, it does feel uh, that it has a chance to remain academic. And if you if you make it more like a, a sort of a, a shared um, yeah a shared manufacturing method with existing rods, then uh, yeah. then uh, I think it has more chance. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we have to move on. We are slightly behind. Um, however, uh, it's nice to see how the different project ideas come together today. Um, and I also see many connections. I have tons of questions, but maybe we can discuss more uh, at the end of the day. Uh, thank you again, Norman, for presenting your work. We will now be moving on to our next talk 
Um, and we have uh, Carola Hein from the TU Delft. Welcome, Carola. It's great to have you with us. And I'm sure ah, yeah, now I can also see you. Um, great to have you here. Carola Hein is a professor and head, head of the Chair of History of Architecture and Urban Planning at the TU Delft. She has published widely in the field of architectural, urban and planning history and has tied historical analysis to contemporary development. Among other major grants, she receive, received a Guggenheim Fellowship to pursue research on the global architecture of oil. Um, and furthermore, she received the Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship to investigate large scale urban transformations in Hamburg. Her current research interests include the transmission of architectural and urban ideas focusing spe specifically on port cities and the global architecture of oil. What has this to do with 3D <laughs> printing? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a super interesting research field and, and I, I think it's it's great that you are here today because we see we will see in a minute uh, that the technology is now broadening into into many different uh, fields because today Carola will show us on how 3D printing can provide an opportunity to reproduce missing or destroyed cultural heritage or to express lost appearances in the cases of conflicts or environment, environmental threats. Her research reveals challenges and possibilities of contemporary 3D printing technology in the field of cult cultural heritage. And she and her team are asking, can we reproduce missing elements or even reprinting historical spaces? Thank you for being with us. And uh, I'm looking very, uh, forward um, to your talk. The, the floor is yours and whoever, whoever has the problems uh, with Zoom, we are now live streaming on YouTube as well. Thank you very much for the introduction. That's always the challenge of a 50 word or 100 word uh, CV, uh, which may not reflect all the dimensions of what someone is doing. So maybe I should just add that I, well, coming from Hamburg, I've been involved with heritage, with the rebuilding of an old farmhouse from that time on, and also with Ecomos and other heritage um, organizations. So my heart is in the fact that how can we get a better or different look at the past to better design the future? And that may also have been the start when I talked with uh, Ulrich Knack, who's uh, also here. Uh, on the screen and who is a partner in this in this project. So with that idea, we started looking at how to best how to how to look at historical buildings at heritage and in the field of 3D printing. So in principle, you should be seeing my screen now. Uh, so yes, so then um, the question became when we started looking into this, what are fields in history and heritage that can benefit from new data approaches? And I think it was at that broad. And to build another bridge to my research on ports and cities, my interest is in, into big data and seeing how that big data can be used to create new stories on the past for the future. And in that sense, this is a facet of this larger, this larger concept. So what I would like to talk to you about now is to see how we can use these big data approaches for heritage challenges, heritage practices. And just bear with me because it's going to be a less technical and more um, multidisciplinary approach and the hardcore technical question I'm going then to play through to, to Ulrich. Now, um, so I think the project is interesting and maybe also relevant to the other ones that we've just seen because it brings together humanities, social sciences with technology. And just as a quick reminder, whatever we choose to do in technology depends on specific paradigms, societal paradigms. 
as long as we decide that growth and speed are the things that we're going to, that's the technologies we're going to choose. So if we have a different um, idea, a different societal paradigm, then we might also be choosing different technological solutions. So in that way, I'm really pleading for the inclusion of well, humanities and social scholars and approaches into the technological debate. So in some sense, this is what we try to achieve also with this project by bringing in larger philosophical questions of what does it mean to 3D reprint heritage? Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about those details. So we, the question that we then raised is how can we reprint um, uneven surfaces, curved surfaces that are covered with color or painting? Because that is something that the existing tools and the existing machines couldn't do. So there's a lot of um, very good scholarship on reprinting on flat surfaces to the point that colleagues of ours in Delft reprint uh, Rembrandts. But these machines are not able so far to work with curved surfaces at the scale of the building. So that's when we started to look for potential applications. And what you see here is the Hippolytus Church in the larger Groningen area in uh, Middlestem, so north of Groningen, um, which has a very intriguing history. And so in collaboration between different disciplines, the historians went to the Heritage Agency to figure out what was the history of this particular church, what kind of archives existed, and also what kind of rebuilding practices have already occurred in the past. Because one of the questions that is then raised, well, where do you want to go back to? So as soon as you touch a historical building, you have to decide, am I going back to the moment it was built? Am I going back to some kind of restoration moment? So what are, am I using the 3D printing for in this context? So in this, uh, in the case of the Hippolytus church, this is how the building looked around the 1970s. All the historic paintings had been covered up and then an extensive rebuilding took place in which they in many ways reimagined based on historical sources what these paintings could have been, may have been, because you can never really go back completely to the original. So some of the discussions at the beginning of these projects were really about which period do we reconstruct? And from there on, we dove, dove more into what does it actually mean to reconstruct it? One of the reasons for choosing this particular church was that it had already been scanned, although we quickly came to realize that the scanning that had been done from the floor of the church, some 12 meters up towards the ceiling, was not of the um, depth of the, the quality that we actually needed. And we also chose this church because it is actually under threat. The Groningen area due to the oil uh, the gas exploration, so there's at least a link to the petroleum research. Um, due to the gas uh, exploration, is has been sinking, the soil is sinking, and the church has been cracking. So in this image, you see a crack running through one of these paintings. So again, due to the collaborations between historians, heritage people, technologists, we then opted to choose this specific area, this little angel here, um, for our pilot project. So the aspects that we choose it for were about the overall geometry. As I said, we were looking for a non-flat surface. It was about the textures of the uh, place, the color, the glossiness. So here, this gives you an, an idea about the double curvature that we were actually dealing with in that space. And here is the first uh, excerpt of the part that we were looking at. Now, the questions that this raised were, were multiple. First of all, when you restore a piece, and if we just imagined this church or this part of the church broke down, we wanted to reprint it. 
not only is the questions, are we going back to the historic restoration with its redone design from the 1970s, but we also have to decide, do we take into account all the dirt and other stuff that has gathered on the surface over time? What do we do with, with cracks or irregularities? Imagine it would break down and we had to redo it. Would we pop a new piece in there that is perfectly clean and um, well, without any cracks, or would we try to reuse these cracks? So one of the questions is actually, can you 3D print a crack? So in this case, and uh, we then had to go much closer to the ceiling than just this, the, the scans that had been done from the floor, we found that this crack is probably a centimeter deep, which has shifted in, in two directions. And we opted, and here you can see a bit more on the, on the quality of the painting that is out here, and the multiplicity of the materials used, the surfaces used, and the question of glossiness, which is an important one for paintings like Rembrandt, which you can reprint, but the question is then how. So the, we had to collect these various aspects. As I said, we had to build a sca the scaffolding to get up there, to get closer. And even though we then got up to about two meters off the ceiling, the quality was still not perfect. And we might have wanted even more, uh, even better information of the scanning, but keeping also in mind that we couldn't take samples of the paint itself which would have been necessary because even the scanning part includes different reflections, whether you're in a shadowy place, whether the sun is shining in. Um, and uh, so even the highest resolution that we could get from a hand scanner was not always sufficient. So there's various scanning tools that we tried. All of these data sets were then translated uh, into, into, into a virtual mesh model and from the virtual mesh, the, we then went on to select this area, which included the crack for the actual um, reprinting. So here you can see some more information on the data. And again, here we worked with um, computer scientists or also in the, uh, with, with colleagues in the engineering department. And from this first um, description, we first had a tile of the size, let's say, a little bit bigger than a passport, which included the crack, because the crack in itself also left the question, you can't print a gap into it because then your piece will fall apart. So how do you actually reproduce the gap? In the end, we opted for the solution that you see here with a very thin layer and just depth um, rather than the crack itself. When the per people went up there, it seemed that this crack actually was some several more centimeters deep, uh, but that's not something that we could actually show. So we went through various stages of uh, piloting from um, these various small scale models to bigger ones that we then um, used to abstract from it. We played with various types of materials and you could see that if we used gypsum, you got a very different surface that was not detailed enough to actually show the various layers of, of color that we wanted and different types of uh, acrylate and so on applications. So in the end, we said, let's go for this 80 to 100 centimeter um, piece, going for selecting a piece that also showed a meaningful cutout of the painting which can go back or can be, has been inspired by Dürer. So it's quite an, an, an important piece. And, but given the size of the printing machines, we had to divide it up into four pieces. Then that creates the question, how do you actually deal with the lines between the different pieces? So represented here as yellow and red or yellow and blue, which will always show up in the reprint itself. And how do you deal with the, the various holes and cracks that are not quite like the one on the surface? So one of the problem, and another additional problem that we actually had, and this is partially due also to funding issues, was that we made it so thin 
and that was also calculated by the by the computer scientists um, that the material when it dried actually jumped so what you see here is a gap between the different plates uh, that no longer completely fit together and we had something as wobbly as what you see here it took a lot of uh, uh, physical power to bend them into a shape that allowed us to put them together. And here is the part that you may all have been waiting for, because the question was, how do we get the color on it? So for this project, after lots of discussions and back and forth, we had decided to use a foil and to put it over the 3D printed object that reproduced the various forms and elements of the, of the board itself. Now, these kinds of foils are usually made, or the ones that we found with the help of Dick Flassbaum, was a foil that is usually used for cars, and cars tend to be very shiny. So there were several steps undertaken to get rid of the shininess. And while the shininess is, is important for many paintings, the kind of murals that we were looking at are made in a way that they're specifically not shiny which again is this connection to art historians work looking at it. So these, this, um, the choice for this foil also gave us the opportunity to overcome the cuttings between more or less the cuttings between the different small plates. So you can see down here that in the background, you still get a sense that these were different plates being printed uh, and that were then unified by the foil that was taken over it. We combined this project with a, um, a studio for, for, for architecture students who chose another section, the corner murals that you see here, to rethink what 3D printing could mean for a heritage object. So their task was to say, well, okay, if this fell down, what would we do knowing that 3D printing for this kind of elements would want to respect the aesthetics of it, but also the particular different needs of 3D printing. So the students sought inspiration in the, um, in the aesthetics, in the decoration on the walls. They translated their structural forms into different shapes. And then they came up with new 3D, potentially 3D printed and, and pilot 3D printed objects that could fit into the vaults of the, of the church. So they try to really rethink the, the structural engineering from the, this uh, 15th century church into something that would use 3D printed elements, coming up with something like this. Now, we had already undertaken our own little experiment with the color printed patterns, but we could have imagined taking this kind of a background to better 3D print our elements. Some students actually made it into clickable parts where very filigrane elements where two parts of the flower would click into each other. So our little dragon and the angel could have become clickable 3D printed parts that are put together. You see a close up of these test prints. And all of this to say, if you get a disaster like Notre Dame burning down, we need to be prepared to have answers. One answer is always rebuilding, but at whatever scale we are working and with whatever goals, we might also want to consider 3D printing as a means to recapture these lost monuments. Or it could be a way to multiply, but again, then you come into the discussion also of philosophy and what you want with heritage, multiply such objects, set them up in different locations, which could also become a teaching tool about heritage and one that, well, is, is easier to do than just uh, demolishing and, well, repeating this whole thing. The second project that we did, we took a different approach in terms of how we get color onto the object. So as I said, in the first case, we had found that we could reproduce the surface, even as a curved one, but then we had to solve the complexity of the color on this surface by putting the foil onto it. 
We did a second project with the uh, Mauritzhuis, the so-called golden room, um, to look into these two dimensions, into the horizontal and vertical dimension that you see here, to see how could we reproduce a section, again, as a pilot project of this area with, it, with color. Now, the difference here is that this object is, uh, well, has much more um, continued color rather than this very difficult um, detailed drawing that we have for the other one. Now, in this context, and again, pleading here for multidisciplinary approaches and involving different uh, specialists, it probably took longer to get the permission and the insurance to do the scanning into this famous museum than it took us to do the actual project of scanning and reprinting because we had to set up um, the scanner to create actually the close up of the, the hand scans. Now, here again, working together with um, art historians, they had done research, Marit van Eikema Holmes and Joris Dick had done research on what it was the original color of this specific room. Now, in a historic building like this, you can't just go back and say, okay, let's rip it all down and let's try how it would have looked. So one of the options would be to 3D reprint what they found would have been the original appearance of the room, which is what you see here. Now, in this, uh, in this area now, we choose the section that you see indicated for reprinting. And we came up with the very first uh, pilot project here, uh, re using in the, actual, in the actual material coloring. Now, what ought to be gold, when you look close, actually becomes a pretty ugly yellow green. Also, if you step uh, three, four meters back, it actually looks pretty good. But you, it's very difficult to find the exact coloring. And you can see here that the color actually goes through the material rather than just being layered on top of it. And our experiment with foil wouldn't have been able probably to be stretched enough to cover the depth of the contours that we have here. So that in the end became the, the, the reprinted section that I showed you earlier and remounted to show with its golden parts, the painting, the ways up to the ceiling, um, what this could have been. Again, for among others, uh, cost reasons, we had to make the material as, material as thin as possible. And then uh, Ulrich Knack remounted it with a structure that is actually supporting it. And I would challenge you here uh, by saying, well, do you find an error in this, uh, in this reprint, because as you see now, all of this is printed in small pieces and it becomes really a puzzle of assembly where there is a mistake in there. So we could actually rethink this area, this, uh, this structure to how to remount it. So you can see that in here, we had again to deal with the gaps that connect different pieces and even in the 3D printing, two pieces that are adjacent didn't quite get the same coloring. So um, that's an overview of the two projects we did. I hope I was able to give you an idea of the challenges and the ideas that were behind it and potentially also about the opportunities, what it means to bring different well, different disciplines, different approaches together and make this a much more complex project beyond the, the technology itself. And I would say it was also really an educational experience to be in a room and have every specialist spelling out for everybody else um, what they saw as the opportunities, challenges and their own research questions. And in many ways, that's where it becomes really fascinating when every discipline has their own research questions to deal with. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for this fascinating talk. And uh, thank you to, to connect our very nerdy technology symposium uh, to social paradigms as well. I think that that has an absolute relevance. Um, yeah, maybe as a first question, um, you would you see these new technologies that, um, as I understand it, are not fully developed for your needs? There's there's still technological progress needed to make things almost photorealistic. We had a few years ago we had Philip Orban from the Fraunhofer IGD um, at the Beam Symposium, and he was talking about photorealistic 3D printing. He, he, he prints a human ear and he prints the, 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 the properties of translucency. So if light falls through the ear, it shines red. Um, a very nerdy topic with fascinating results. Uh, however, do, do you see that the way we treat cultural heritage might change? M might there be a new paradigm if we have these technologies or is it just a way of, of refining existing things? You ask, can we print a crack, right? Um, so is it a different approach or is it a refined approach? I, I think it, 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 is, it can be both. And for me, it's in particular, it's a topic of discussion and a, top, and a, a tool of teaching. So if we can get, if you ask uh, a technology, can you do that? You often get the answer, oh, in three years, we'll have the machine that will be able to do what you want. Well, first, I want to know what it means that we, if we want it, and what would then happen, right? Um, and it's, it's intriguing to challenge many of the technologies that are be being developed for small objects. So anything larger than under 75 centimeters, beyond 75 centimeters, basically. Because even the Fraunhofer Institute, which you just mentioned already, they have a whole system set up to scan sculptures and things like that, at least to scan them. And then once you have the data to reproduce them, hopefully. But even, bre so even breaking up this process, what does it mean if you can generate the data, like the one we had of the church in the interior? Well, if you want to reprint it, that quality is not sufficient. So just storing, for example, scans of all the important historic buildings will not help us in 100 years to reprint them because they, are not, they will not be sufficient. On top of it, we never have the depth of the material. So you only have the surface, and if it's dirt, it's dirt. But maybe you really want to know what kind of material, what kind of construction, and other things are behind it. So I, and, and, and I can go on and on with these kinds of challenges that we have seen by making this circle work. So for me personally, it's much more about, let's see if we connect this circle of historic research, uh, tools to scan and to reproduce, to show, to see what kind of impact on society it has. We should be refining it because we will always be losing objects. But we should be also thinking very carefully, how does it change and impact our way of thinking about historical objects? I mean, there's something to be said, I want to sit in candlelight in the Mauritz house, which I will never be able to do, uh, but maybe we can reprint it and make it possible for people. So if we can get more acceptance and more interest in heritage structures by replicating it, let's go for it, but let's not pretend that these are the original ones. So I think that's the balance we need to strike. Yes. I, I, may, I may add on to that. Uh, Carola and me were discussing this outline and we ended up in the Netherlands, but uh, at that time Aleppo was under fire. So we thought maybe we do that. And then obviously the next one is, uh, can we reprint Venice in China just to give friends in China a simpler way to get there and yes it's not the original one but it mimics the original one and um, you may argue this is Disney um, but you also uh, you, when you have kids you know Disney is important so um, uh, it, it's an interesting interesting field uh, where you can easily say politically get lost but what was also learned in this process is that uh, technically um, 
um, the freaks, the 3D printing freaks, as they are now in this environment, um, they are happy when they can do certain things. But when you ask the others, which want something being perfect, well, there's still a lot of work to do, which is a good experience. Mm -hmm. Guys, do you want to add something to the discussion right now? You're muted, Guys. Uh, Guys, you're muted. We, we, we can't hear you. You have to put on your microphone. Yeah, should be better. Yeah, no. So, it, really interesting uh, question to to decide what to do because, uh, yeah, as uh, as you already mentioned, uh, all the three D printing freaks once they find the rabbit hole, they dive into it and they just continue until someone tells them this is not a useful technology. Um, so it, it's, it's quite interesting to see on the, on the uh, beginning uh, what, what you would uh, uh, want to build as a technology, what you would need. But uh, I, I had a question uh, was, uh, if, if you would get a budget and a team, what kind of technology would you uh, try to create based on the research that you did? <laughs> I give Uli, Uli a first answer and then I'll try one. <laughs> um... It was a pain to get the, the digital data in a level that it could be manufactured. That was, um, that was really a pain. Um, then the, say, the, the surface quality, when I'm not talking as an, as an architect and not as a techno freak, the surface quality of the printed results, either the one with foil or the one with the uh, polymer and, um, and uh, pigments, um, it still was a bit sticky. It still wasn't uh, the, the, the final surface. When we saw the printed um, art objects, uh, uh, Oliver, as you described it, from the colleague which presented some years ago in, uh, at Beam, or from uh, the colleague in uh, Delft who really did scans of prominent architecture. And well, I wasn't able to see the differences, even in surface quality. If you come to that level, well, then it's really nice. But uh, then uh, how square meter of this printed piece of art is worth, I don't know, 50K or something. So if you unlimited the budget, then we are happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot of technology which needs to be investigated. And on Carola's side, it's say this, uh, this obvious discussion, are we allowed to do this Disney? And how deep do we go for this Disney? And how much do we show it's Disney? Exactly. And I mean, that's what I was going to add. If you give us this unlimited budget, I think you would make a lot of historians, heritage experts, urbanists, and so on and so forth happy by allowing them to co-shape the kind of technology that's actually going on. So that you can talk about um, questions of societal justice, who gets access to it? Should it be everywhere so that every school kid can see it around the world? Or should it be limited to a few places? Those kinds of questions we need to first spell out. But that's what yours. We, that's exactly, but that's you gave me the rest of the budget, right? Um, but in order to make sure that this has a sense, because in the end, all the heritage is about having sense for all of humanity, we need to bring everybody al al along and we have to facilitate conversations. And what I personally appreciate a lot is the amount of things that I've learned about technology and even kind of forcing people to spell out in, for regular people what they are doing. And for me then to retranslate that and also bring the kind of approaches that I have in looking at history back to these people. And we're working to the techno technological people. We're working, for example, with Time Machine Europe, where those questions are at the forefront of trying to find out what big data of the past can actually mean for the future. And that includes building an identity for Europe. So I do think that with any of these technological questions, you are asking for much, you're asking much broader questions. And in order to discuss them together, you have to have a shared knowledge base. And that's what I think was this project was really great in. So if I have this unlimited budget, I would go for this multidisciplinary approach. Thanks. Yep, that, that's a nice closing word, having an unlimited budget. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I think what you achieve within a very limited budget, I think this is, this is even more impressive because there is no unlimited budget. So in that sense, um, thank you very much for this great talk. And um, 
we now have to move on to our session number four, which will be moderated by Reis van der Felden. And uh, we, we, we have the full range from mud printing to, and I'm happy to say that finally, rocket science. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Let's see, is my screen visible? Yes, it is. Is it in present mode as well? Yes. All right. So uh, yeah, just a brief recap of uh, uh, who I am, uh, Gijs van der Velde. Uh, I uh, led the, the bridge project in, uh, in Amsterdam, uh, which is now nearing its completion. Uh, so as uh, just mentioned, uh, we have uh, taken away the, the temporary bridge and uh, our bridge is going to be placed. Uh, of course, uh, Corona can can uh, put uh, some uh, some delays on still, but uh, that uh, that's hopefully manageable. Um, uh, so so a, a project that uh, uh, that we did uh, also, of course, limited budget, but mainly to break free from the restraints of this. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the objects that, uh, that people have been printing and limited to 70, uh, 70 centimeters and then 50,000 euros, we said, okay, we, we have to uh, come up with something that allows us to, to make the scale jump. And, and this bridge uh, shows uh, that that's possible. Um, so, so of course, uh, together with the Imperial College London, uh, it's extensively tested. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean approved because it's going to be in a very busy area in, in the city, so it has to withhold uh, a lot and uh, it cannot fail. Um, uh, but we, we included also a, a sensor system that allows us to understand how a structure behaves. So, of course, we don't know yet how this uh, material is going to behave over the next 50 years. Um, you know, we're in it for the long game. Uh, additive manufacturing is going to take at least, uh, especially for architecture, uh, 10, 15 years to, uh, to come up with uh, both the business case, uh, but also all the science behind it that uh, is required um, uh, for the safety concerns. And this uh, sensor system that we have installed uh, will help us with that. Uh, so of course we understand how it's behaving now when put under pressure, uh, but we wanna understand how it's behaving when the sun is on there, uh, when uh, it's lying around there for uh, two years or more. And uh, when you have uh, this uh, yeah, special events that, that we haven't thought about or couldn't test. Um, so this really allows us to go one step further into uh, the optimization process in the future. Um, uh, just yeah, quickly for people that don't know wire arc additive manufacturing, that's the basic technology. So we use a welding robot and uh, a piece of software that we created uh, to, to print either layer on layer or dot by dot. And uh, here you see it uh, sped up a bit. So also my comment before, uh, it's, it's a relatively slow process for architecture. Um, so uh, you have to imagine two to three kilos per hour uh, when putting down, uh, uh, you know, an FDM kind of strategy. And if you do a dot by dot, uh, then uh, two and a half meters is already a good uh, achievement, uh, two and a half meters per hour. So, so it definitely solves a problem in the area uh, uh, beyond the metal printing that we have now. So we can print bigger objects sensibly and economically, um, but, but still for, for architectural size uh, objects, uh, it's, it's challenging. Uh, so we, we work a lot on the automation. So uh, of course, when, when you cut out the human labor uh, side and everything goes fully automated, uh, you have uh, more of a chance of it becoming uh, an interesting, uh, uh, technology uh, for, for companies uh, to use uh, because maybe it takes a bit longer, but it doesn't need any, any staff uh, so that the cost there is less. Uh, so we created a small uh, slicer, uh, but also uh, connected to a sensor package that allows us to monitor and adapt uh, while we print. Um, and yeah, relevant to this session, I think uh, is uh, whether, whether a technology like this uh, could have a space application. And uh, I think one of the, the real benefits of uh, additive, but also uh, this technology is that you can reduce the weight of um, uh, the parts you need. And uh, when I was researching uh, for the next uh, speaker, I also saw that uh, this is important because the, the rocket equation says that it pays off significantly when you minimize uh, the structural mass of the vehicle. Uh, so 
uh, less mass is is good for for space and uh, and therefore uh, we uh, can consider printing uh, larger rocket parts so this is a relativity space um, a colleague of us in in the wam industry solely focusing on on, on printing vessels um but but i guess this is this is for space uh, but one of the questions we also want to uh, discuss uh, today uh, is uh, whether we can print in space um yeah we we of course dream of this uh, i mean uh, you know whenever we have time uh, we print uh, interesting uh, objects uh, so um to uh, keep ourselves enthusiastic for this um yeah our technology has has a couple of disadvantages of course you need a lot of power uh, you need gas which uh, blows away uh, out there uh, and uh, and you need to bring all the materials there uh, so uh, whether that's feasible uh, i don't i don't really know um but but obviously there's there's already a lot of people thinking about uh, how you can work with uh, local materials uh, which seems to have a lot of potential uh, but then of course you need uh, some type of full automation and uh, artificial intelligence to solve all these problems that you encounter um, yeah, so uh, MX3D had uh, the opportunity already to cross the path of uh, the ESA, the European Space Agency, several times. And uh, if Corona permits, we will have a really nice project to show for um, in a couple of months' time. Um, so uh, I, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but but in that uh, in these contexts, uh, I didn't meet uh, Dr. Engineer uh, Shara Manfletti yet. Um, she is the program advisor uh, to the director general at the space agency, and she's going to be our next speaker. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, she gives she has the enviable position to help out to determine the goals of the future ASA space projects. I mean, you know, who wouldn't want to have that job? Sounds like a really nice, uh, nice place to be. Um, so, a uh, very interesting long resume, educated at the Imperial College uh, and the International Space University in Strasbourg. Uh, she collaborated with NASA and the German uh, uh, Aerospace Center DRL. Um, and uh, she is the president of the Portuguese Space Agency. Um, besides her strong engineering skills, and uh, focus on space propulsion systems. Uh, she also likes to do beekeeping and has a basic knowledge in Japanese, um, but no mention of 3D printing. So uh, uh, fortunately I saw the, the Beam book where, uh, where uh, she does uh, go deeper into her uh, 3D printing uh, interests as well, but uh, I'm, I'm very curious to see uh, what, uh, what she can present for us today. So over to you, Chara. Thank you very much. Uh, it's true. Huh? Um, I do not have a background in 3D printing. I am a liquid rocket uh, propulsion engineer from uh, my uh, um, experience and what I've done. And uh, so what I am actually going to share with you today, and good afternoon, everyone, is um, what we at the European Space Agency have been working on over the years. Um, I'm not necessarily the expert. Um, so um, I also have a couple of names. And I'm hoping that you'll seeing the slides. Um, are you seeing the slides? Can someone just give me a quick confirmation? Yes, Perfect. Yes. Okay. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, so you see here all the names uh, also of my colleagues, Tommaso Guedini and Jérôme Breteau. Uh, one of them works in the materials um, part of ESA. The other one works also in liquid rocket propulsion and in space transportation. And if you should have any also detailed questions about specific projects that we've done, please don't hesitate to uh, write to them. You see that I've, you know, email is just first name dot last name at ESA dot INT. So it's very simple. Um, as I said, in the presentation, I'll be sharing some of the things that we do at the European Space Agency, but just a quick introduction of what it is uh, that we do um, as an agency. We are an intergovernmental agency which actually pushes forward industrial policy interests of member states, meaning that member states uh, define high strategy lines that they want to be implementing in space. And uh, they try and do this together in a European spirit and for that they need uh, us. We have 22 member states spread across Europe, meaning that if at any stage uh, anyone listening is interested in, in working in space, then certainly we could have a talk. And then we would also have to have a chat with uh, the delegates of your respective countries uh, to see how we could bring things forward. 
Um, now, at uh, ESA and why am I showing this slide, I'll get to it in a second. We have the ambition, of course, of serving society and of serving the economy. As I said, there is a strong industrial policy component uh, in what uh, we do, uh, but we are extremely keen on serving also the environment. And when I talk about the environment, it's not just our environment um, and the sustainability of things that we do. And I do think that 3D printing and advanced manufacturing certainly go in that direction, but it's also about in space, right? And we, when we talk about uh, debris, when we talk about also going further, sustainability is a key from also uh, certainly a financial point of view. Going to the moon uh, the way we did back in the days would not necessarily be considered sustainable. And that's part of the reason why the Apollo program didn't continue. So now we don't talk about going back to the moon, but going forward to the moon in a sustainable way. Um, we do this through different roles that we have, meaning that we uh, engage in R&D elements, but we also have public-private partnerships with uh, industries that believe that their product is more advanced and has a strong business case uh, to it. We try and be a customer wherever we see that there is a, a possibility to do so. But we have also testing facilities where SMEs and researchers can, can come and, and use these facilities, uh, which otherwise would not be available to them. And sometimes we just act as brokers. So uh, don't hesitate, again, to be in touch with us for different reasons. Now, in terms of the actual content of what we do and where materials and specifically 3D printing advanced manufacturing comes into play, this is all of the topics that we deal with. So we are dealing with science and exploration, looking into the secrets of the universe, building satellites and probes that go to different planets and um, you know, deep into the solar system to doing human exploration in low Earth orbit and looking forward again to the moon and then onto Mars at some stage. But we also deal with safety and security. And here, for example, things like um, Space weather is an issue. Radiation uh, levels are an issue again. And this also plays into uh, how we build, manufacture, and the kind of materials that we can put in place. Debris, debris impact is, a, is always an element, right? So these are also things that we need to consider in our processes. We talk about, of course, um, also asteroids. And asteroids and that brings me to uh, the idea of also in situ resource utilization and this, you know, again, how do we make use of resources in space rather than bringing stuff from Earth, which already is, is you know, there's not enough to go around as it seemed. Uh, so how do we use the stuff that is in space? In terms of applications, we look at Earth observation, telecommunications, navigation. Here the pressure is because it's commercial activities, how can we use advanced manufacturing to reduce time to market, reduce costs, uh, and go from you know, a niche sector where we produce one-offs to uh, you know, mass market, right? How can we make things faster? In enabling and support, we develop technologies. We have a fleet of launchers that we've developed over the um, decades. That's actually one of the reasons where, uh, why ESA came into being. And indeed, as you heard, there's a, a rocket equation. And this rocket equation says, let's try and make sure that the structure that you uh, have to use to bring whatever it is that you want to have in orbit is the minimum. And most of the rest is either payload or propellant. Um, so reducing the cost, uh, uh, but the weight of stuff is extremely, extremely important. So, um, oops. Too fast. So in in um, in summary, in summary, I would say that the things that we look at are access to space systems, right? So our rockets, we want them to be cost effective, payload friendly. We, there's uh, certain accelerations that the payloads have to um, go through. You know, it can be uh, if it's a human payload, we try and to be uh, kind uh, to the humans that are put into orbit and subject them to just a few Gs. But if it's it's uh, just structures, it could be up to um, even 10 G. There's thermal uh, constraints, there's vibrations, acoustic environments. And then one day we're also thinking of reusability, as I'm sure you, you've heard if you follow a bit of what we do in space. So how, do, how does all of this play a role into the materials and manufacturing elements that we look at? Then we have in space systems, right? So it's, these are spacecraft which remain in orbit or in space during most of their functional life. Here, we always try and minimize volume and mass. Why? Because we have to put it in orbit and putting them in orbit costs a lot of money. Um, so it's, it's beyond just the manufacturing cost of the element itself. We try and minimize obviously power consumption and not violate obviously the thermal operating 
condition conditions of each component. Uh, the trends are that we miniaturize again to reduce the cost um, of access to space. And then of course there's planetary systems which go to other bodies, Moon, Mars, Jupiter, comets. Again, here we want to try to build small and efficient as much as possible. Um, but we are obviously uh, constrained also by the conditions that we have in, um, in the solar system and uh, sort of thermal day night gradients which can, uh, can sort of happen either when you're orbiting uh, or can also happen just from one side of the object to the other. And of course, we have the same thing on Earth, but with an atmosphere that keeps us warm. Just as a summary, uh, these are sort of the boundary conditions that we have to deal with in terms of gravitation, in terms of surface temperatures when we decide to look at other uh, bodies. And you can see that the range are, are very different. So when we think of going to the moon, uh, we have to consider elements that are not just can withstand these um, these temperatures, um, but and and the, and can be uh, sort of operated in these gravitational conditions, but also the processes that we have are uh, compatible to this. I mentioned already the constraints that we have when we launch. Now, just a bit of an overview of what we've done in propulsion. Propulsion is probably one of the most uh, costly elements in access to space and launchers beyond being, if you will know, one of the most critical elements without propulsion, you don't get anywhere, right? So we've started with things which are very small. And what you see here is um, a very small thruster. It's a 10 Newton, so it's it's tiny. Um, these are used on satellites and the, um, the combustion chambers and the thrusters, so the nice shiny metal uh, part which you see uh, is that which produces thrust um, to, uh, to, to move the object around. They are normally made out of platinum, uh, platinum because of uh, the thermal cycles that they have to go through and because these structures cannot be cooled. Um, so they're normally use, using hydrazine, the pressures in them are up to maximum 20 bar. They go through lots and lots of cycles. In any case, in 2015, we had the first uh, 3D printed platinum combustion chamber, which was successfully hot fired in a campaign. Um, looking again into propulsion systems, we went then higher in terms of uh, thrust. So we went to bigger systems. And here we were working with storbo propellants. These are propellants that are liquid at um, ambient temperature and uh, pressure. Um, so it's nitrogen, tetraoxide, and MMH. Um, again, pressures are about 20 bar. What is challenging here, of course, is that the thrust chamber throat temperature can be high as high as uh, up as 3000 Kelvin. So the inner structure somehow has to be cooled and normally we have some cooling channels. So the challenge here again is how do we manufacture uh, something like this so that the cooling channels uh, remain good enough and so that the inner surface also of the combustion chamber doesn't cause too much friction, which would have all sorts of impacts on boundary layers and on thermal gradients across the structure. Um, that was not enough. So we then went to the next biggest challenge, which was a Vinci combustion chamber. Vinci is yet another um, liquid rocket uh, engine. This has a yet higher thrust, 130 kilonewtons, 60 bar internal pressure. But the nice thing here is that it's uh, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen. So the materials that or the fluids that we are sending through the cooling channels and then through the combustion chamber are originally cryogenic. And then of course, again, the thrust um, temperatures, uh, the thrust, um, the throat chamber um, temperatures go up to about 3,200 Kelvin, right? So it's, it's really, really hot. Uh, we he use here um, copper uh, in the inner lining because of its thermal conductivity, which is excellent. And generally we have a nickel lining on the outside. Uh, of course, here the challenge would be uh, how to produce a single structure out of two different uh, alloys and perhaps even to tailor the alloys such that they are uh, also optimal from a manufacturing point of view in this new manufacturing paradigm. Final example and near final example is the uh, biggest um, engine that will produce in Europe, which is LOX methane. These still remain uh, cryogenic. This is then a thousand kilonewtons. So this is the range of things that we have in the uh, central stage of Ariane 5 um, and Ariane 6. 
Um, and here we're looking at very many components that will be 3D uh, printed. So it's not just the thrust chambers as I've shown you so far, but it's things like pump casings, what you see here, and uh, all sorts of manifolds as well. Just to give you a sense of perspective for an engine, which is about uh, between 1,000 and 2,000 kilonewtons, the turbo pump uh, assembly, basically the pump, the turbine that drives um, and increases the pressure for the fluids to be pumped in the combustion chamber where the chamber pressures are of about 150 bar. Each one of them weighs between 500 kilos and a ton. Okay, so these are big pieces. So again, um, reducing the weight is extremely important. And um, in many cases, what we also have is in combustion chambers, we have injection elements. And when it gets to these big engines, we can have as many as 500 injector elements. So uh, being able to produce these so that they don't have to be singly manufactured and singly screwed on also make uh, assembly processes and manufacturing processes a lot, a lot faster. And this obviously also drives the cost down the cost. Other elements in uh, propulsion are things like filters, uh, where here we have one that we've produced uh, from a titanium alloy. It's a monolithic design. Um, again, it's about reducing manufacturing time and cost um, of, these, uh, of these elements. Um, another thing which is important for us is um, looking towards not just the material characterization, the smoothness of the components when it comes to fluidic properties and elements, but also how can we, when we also look towards qualification and certification to flight, but also reusability is how do we have non-destructive uh, investigation and uh, insights into the um, health of these components after we've used them. So that's certainly another element that we've been looking into, especially looking for, again, upper stage um, engines as this one, which you see, which is a subscale element of an upper stage engine. Again, um, liquid oxygen methane for the Vega upgrade uh, vehicle, which is Vega E. Uh, we certainly look into also then uh, what we can do for satellites, and I just have a couple of examples here. For example, you see uh, solar panel brackets uh, where the solar panels are attached to the satellites, which are now produced in, in single pieces rather than multiple pieces, um, and uh, where they are obviously also designed to have a better structural performance for lower weight. Um, uh, some things that we're also doing for the structural performance are also linked to the structure of the launchers themselves. Here is another example of a, a titanium alloy bracket that we've uh, looked into for um, the Ariane 6, where we've seen a 30% mass saving. Uh, and we produce uh, sort of 20 to 30 of these brackets per launcher. And here in this picture, you see sort of the prior, which is on the top right design, to the lower uh, design, which you see is then also designed a lot more to fulfill the functionality of it and is not just very simple because of uh, manufacturing um, uh, constraints or, or reasons. Other things that we've we've done for launchers is uh, looking at polymer polymeric vent ports for uh, Vega. Or again, we're just reducing uh, reducing the number of components and therefore the assembly complexity of, of the things that we do. Um, just a couple of pictures here of, uh, of the assembly of these elements then on the launcher itself. Um, another thing which I find extremely interesting is when we look into the topic of debris, uh, debris you can sort of do two things with. You can consider recycling in space, and this is certainly one of the topics that we'll be looking into, the whole sort of economy and cycle of, of materials in space. But when objects come down, demisability is sort of another material property that's interesting for us because we don't want things to sort of come down and, and plonk in your living rooms. I mean, it's nice to get some space gadgets uh, for free, uh, but you know, there's some damage that it can do. So how can it sort of break up in the atmosphere? And what you see here, of course, is a design where uh, there's going to be a lot of heat pickup and therefore it's going to break down very easily as it re-enters into the atmosphere, right? So things like heat capacity, thermal conductivity, um, density of the material, these all play uh, play a low. So we, we are also trying to lead in how to design for demisability of our structures. 
And then, of course, we come to the exciting topic of producing in space for space activities. And we have looked at uh, various uh, elements here. Um, you know, we've we've brought up a couple of uh, printers on the ISS in the US. They've they've done as far as I know, also food printing. So far, we haven't done any of that. Uh, but what you see here is, for example, a fused uh, deposition modeling printer, which was on the ISS, uh, an Italian-led project, and where now these components that was printed in, in, in space is being sort of cross-checked with something that was printed on Earth to see what the quality was. Uh, we also had uh, a 3D printer that was uh, specifically designed for weightlessness and uh, can also print using recycled plastics. Again, we're starting to look into this closed loop reuse of materials, which is extremely important if we want to move forward in space. And uh, this printer was able to uh, print in different directions. And I have a pretty video, which I hope you can see. So um, in any case, it's managed to produce a couple of things. And again, uh, the idea here is uh, you can't carry up possibly everything that you will possibly need, even as an astronaut fixing things. So if we can produce stuff in space, it certainly also makes us a lot more flexible in the things that we can do. And it can help us you know, tackle any challenge that can come our way. Um, Obviously, as I was mentioning, human exploration is what drives our curiosity the most, uh, of course. And the idea of one day, you know, spending uh, some time on the moon, I'm certainly, uh, I'm certain, has also uh, tickled your imagination. Uh, we do certainly look into how we could do this best. It has to be sustainable from a resources point of view, but we also have to make sure that we protect um, the astronauts that move, uh, that are in the, on the moon and go towards the moon and even Mars. And I've mentioned already the, the item of solar radiation. We have to ha also protect them from meteorites. So being able to print structures on the moon using resources on the moon or other bodies is certainly something that uh, would, would help us um, make sure that exploration is sustainable and also break new boundaries. Uh, I'm sure you've heard in Luxembourg, there's significant investments looking towards uh, the uh, the use of resources, even on asteroids. That would be um, for other purposes as well, but uh, it, it goes in the same direction. Uh, parallel to this, of course, we're also looking at how we can perhaps go into so-called uh, lava tubes on the moon, so going um, underground. Uh, but part of um, the things that one could consider that doing on the moon, if we were to able to build structures with the resources there, are even uh, beyond the human elements in craters, build things like also telescopes that we could use to do excellent astronomy from, from the, um, uh, the far side of the moon, not necessarily the dark side of the moon. Um, so again, the idea here is to uh, to cannibalize elements from things that are already there, but also extract things from uh, resources that are available um, um, in the on the planets and bodies that we go to, and then of course recycle things that we uh, do. We aim, of course, always then to bring benefit back to Earth, and our ambition, of course, is to make sure that through exploration, then the whole of humanity benefits. Therefore, pushing again for recycling culture, uh, but also supporting in uh, you know those. Um, for example, post earthquake or tsunami support where um, there's there's uh, also difficulty in continuing uh, sustained uh, life and infrastructure. And then where we have also limited resource manufacturing like in, in desert and remote areas. So that's where we think we can also bring benefit back to earth. I'm sure you've seen this picture. Um, this is where we had uh, tried to make, if you will, a one-off element. We had used a simulated um, lunar regolith, which we then mixed with magnesium oxide, um, put in a salt binder to produce a sort of a, um, 
a B uh, hive uh, structure in order to have exactly these uh, elements uh, that we can consider sort of domes on the moon to protect then the habitats that we would have inside again from either solar radiation or things like meteorite. Uh, We've also looked into solar sintering using solar light. What you see here is actually a project that was done uh, with DLR. They have uh, infrastructure to, um, to do this. This does not require any binder. The project itself was looking both at the design of the equipment and the challenges um, and the process, forgive me, and the challenges. Some of the challenges that we of course had were the thermal stresses, the fact that we have uh, vacuum conditions um, on the moon, for example, and of course the actual regolith behavior as it's handled. Um, I was mentioning uh, limited resource manufacturing. Uh, this is certainly something that we've been looking into for our elements towards um, Mars. Um, some of the difficulties or challenges that we've uh, looked uh, into were the binder ratio, the stickiness of the um, of the extruded material, the sagging of the actual extruded material, and again, the behavior in vacuum. We have looked into ceramics as well for a planetary settlement. Uh, what you see here are some of the elements that have been printed with extremely fine resolutions. Again, this also ties in into in situ resource utilization uh, for manufacturing spare parts and electronic components. Uh, finally, what we also do is we look into extraction of materials from the regolith, be it oxygen, which will help us, and I was mentioning to you the rockets uh, that use liquid oxygen and hydrogen, so we can use it for propellant, for propulsion elements, and I don't know why my thing is moving forward. I don't know if someone's telling me I'm running out of time. Um, but um, so we extract the materials and to see whether we can then again go into um, additive uh, manufacturing, 3D printing uh, on site for the various elements. Finally, uh, and I think this will lead on nicely to, uh, I understand the next uh, presentation, the next keynote, we have been looking into 3D printing for um, bioprinting for, for, for human tissue, and this is obviously linked to um, human exploration. I won't present the slide in detail, this is just to say that we've looked into it and this is certainly of great interest to us as we look for uh, sustainable exploration and um, dealing with, you know, if you go to Mars, you can't really go and come back very quickly if you have a medical emergency. So being able to do such things would also help from a uh, medical and human support uh, point of view. So that was that was it. I hope I was able to give you perhaps not the most detailed technical presentation that you've heard today, but one that was more spanning what we do across uh, ESA in the different domains that are related to space. So thank you very much for listening. And if there's any questions, and please do let me know. Thanks, Kiara. It's a very interesting presentation. I think, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's cool to see the different uh, aspects of 3D printing uh, within ESA. Uh, one, one of the questions came up uh, for me is, uh, I, I, we uh, at least uh, thought about participating in the, in the NASA uh, uh, additive manufacturing challenge uh, to, to, to print a dome. And uh, is, there, is there anything like a, a vision at ESA for, uh, for one of these kind of projects? Because I would say uh, that would help a lot in, in defining uh, what kind of uh, developments uh, should be picked and, and uh, prioritized. Um, because now we've seen quite a few separate projects, but not like this one vision of uh, in, in 2025, we are going to 3D print a, a dome on, on the moon or something like that. Do, do you think there is something like this? Well, we do. We, I mean, we do have different visions. I mean, in the sense that you know, we we member states put a significant amount of money together, right? It's it's um, member states alone. It's like four and a half billion a year. So we can allow ourselves to have multiple three D visions, if you will, in this mm -hmm. uh, four point five billion a year. And there's certainly part of it which is linked to launchers, definitely, without a doubt. Um, when it comes to exploration, we are uh, having very strong initiatives uh, and we are pushed mostly by the Luxembourg uh, 
of Luxembourg of doing in situ research utilization. We don't necessarily have said we want to print a dome on the moon. This we haven't, um, but we do want to put, uh, you know, the first boots on the moon again um, by the end of the decade, right? So um, that is there and. Uh, and associated to that is the fact that because we want to do it sustainably, we will absolutely have to look into this. Um, I can look into if we haven't an, announced a challenge or so, I can ask my colleagues um, because I'm, I'm not specifically in the exploration program. So I can ask my colleagues if there's a planned challenge or something which specifically responds to your, um, to your, uh, to your answer, uh, to your question. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I have a couple of audience questions. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just uh, read them out. I haven't uh, uh, sort of selected them. Uh, so uh, yeah. here, let's see what what's there. Architecture and aerospace have historically always been linked together, albeit aerospace has generally always been a few steps ahead. Do you have any advice for civil engineers working with this new technology? Can you draw up from your successes and maybe fails in uh, this field, which could be useful uh, to bear in mind? So, um, so I, I don't know if we've been up a few steps ahead. Uh, this I cannot comment on. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not quite sure uh, where what the question is aiming at. So I'll, I'll try and give an answer. And if it's not correct, then I hope the person will get back to me in any case. Um, I do think that if we are looking at elements for the moon and specifically these things that we've been looking at, uh, architecture needs to be part of the equation, right? Uh, from different perspectives. So civil engineering is certainly extremely important for us and we should touch base with one another. And there are there's more than enough need for civil engineers uh, to, uh, uh, to work uh, with us. Um, now, now, from, um, uh, from the advice that I can give back to civil engineering as such uh, in 3D printing, no, this I cannot, uh, this I, I, don't, I don't think I know enough of what's going on in 3D printing and civil engineering uh, to give any feedback on, on, to make any comment on this statement as such. All right. Again, I'm not quite sure what the question was aiming at, yeah, I'm afraid. For it was that. Uh, maybe a bit generic. So uh, there, there is a, another question. And uh, uh, to summarize it, uh, I think um, uh, the question is whether you have seen uh, interesting projects uh, where uh, the, the recycling of, um, yeah, in your case, space uh, waste uh, um, is, uh, is uh, being uh, shown as, as a possibility. So I personally know one from the Dutch Design Week where uh, a designer uh, collects uh, plastic waste and then he shreds it to pieces and then 3D prints uh, a new uh, functional parts again. Um, but, but I think, yeah, it could be, could be interesting to see if there is any of these uh, projects out there already that uh, have been successful. Well, I think the Melt uh, 3D printer I was uh, showing to you uh, has exactly this purpose, right? Uh, so that was one that I would have uh, showcased today. I'd have to look into uh, if we have more uh, beyond the ones that you just mentioned. Um, I don't specifically know if we have others. Uh, however, I can tell you that you know recycling and sustainability is a big issue. So uh, we, if we don't already have enough, I'm sure there will be more coming up and if there's anyone with great ideas then please do knock on our doors <laughs> yeah. i think that's a, that's a great uh, invitation to end uh, end uh, your presentation thank you very much thank and, you very uh, much yeah and uh, i will uh, will lead into uh, the next uh, presenter which is a uh, sandy kerr um so uh, yeah a couple of months ago uh, me and my wife uh, we were uh, watching the computer i guess not the tv and uh, we saw this great uh, project of uh, a 3D printed uh, earthen uh, architectural structure. Um, I believe it was in, in relation to the winning of the 3D printing challenge, which um, we participated in as well, but lost uh, uh, to, uh, amongst others, uh, this, uh, this project. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, the earth, uh, rammed earth always has a bit of a, a dusty, or as we say in Holland, the goat wool socks uh, image. Uh, so, so this this project uh, really gives it a revitalized uh, idea, and I think it's really important because the yeah the, the materials are very uh, yeah ecologically sane uh, and uh, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, there's a lot of cost to it, and everybody can do it. And I think this is uh, of course also one of your uh, focus points. Um, uh, so 
yeah, great, uh, great to have you then uh, in in uh, as a presenter in this session. Um, you hold uh, an architecture master at Berkeley University, and you're now a PhD student at uh, the MIT Computation Department, a designer, computational researcher whose work focuses on the development of tools uh, for a more democratic access to architectural additive manufacturing. Uh, you received many awards already, um, including a very impressive sounding presidential scholarship uh, for, for MIT. And uh, yeah, and we share uh, the experience of uh, being uh, part of having been part of the Norman Foster uh, robotics workshops, uh, which are very interesting in, in Spain. Uh, he invites uh, uh, scholars from around the world uh, to work on uh, these uh, yeah, uh, environmentally interesting uh, concepts of additive manufacturing or robotics applications in architecture. Um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm uh, very keen. I, have, I already have a couple of questions for you uh, after the presentation, but uh, very keen to see your, uh, see your story. Thank you for the kind introduction. Can you hear me okay? I will screen share. Um, so it's an honor to be here. I'm glad I can talk about some of this recent work. Uh, as we'll see momentarily here, it's a bit in contrast to the uh, European Space Agency, but I hope it's actually just a step on the road to some of that work. Um, I, of course, am a, a huge fan of that work. I just uh, have somehow transitioned from uh, space space research and physics into shoveling mud, which I'll get into in a minute here. Hopefully it makes sense. Um, so this will be a presentation on the, uh, the quest for, for big mud, large scale additive manufacturing in earth, specifically locally sourced earth, um, printed on site, uh, outside, not inside a warehouse, just out in the world. Um, so of course, first, it's always important to, to talk a bit about why earth is, is actually a material to take seriously in our modern age of concrete and carbon fiber and all of these other things. Uh, first off, um, over 3 billion people live and work in earthen structures every day. Um, many of them are complex buildings with great structural performance. Uh, this, this top image is actually in Germany or recently constructed, somewhat recently constructed dome. Here you see eight to 10 story housing units in Yemen and some more contemporary modern earthen architecture that's rammed earth. Um, so I think this is a good context to begin with. You have people all over the world who are engaging their own local materials and using their knowledge to build you know, quite serious architecture with a material that we don't see much in, in an urban setting, which I think is in large part to a, a failing of codes and standards um, for this material. So, just the general overview, uh, my work revolves around local material um, and the flexible cheap tools that can be created to make it more accessible to people who can actually utilize this technology for something productive in their lives that they need. Um, and kind of, uh, this is a funny thing to say after these previous presentations, but my work is largely about turning this complicated uh, thing we call a robot into a much more useful thing we call it a tool that everybody understands. Um, and I hope we, we can make a few steps towards that. Um, so the team for most of this work that I'll be showing is uh, Logman, Barack, Virginia, and Ron Real. Uh, we're largely associated with emerging objects, uh, Ron and Virginia's uh, design firm. So, uh, to begin with, a, a lot of this work started at a small scale, testing out whether or not it's possible to mass produce uh, ceramic products with a ceramic 3D printer, um, using a variety of different materials and creating forms that are otherwise unachievable um, with standard industry practices like slip casting, ram press molds, that sort of work. And we were relatively successful in doing this, um, creating many hundreds of these, of these cups and uh, little espresso vessels. Um, this is exciting because it meant that we could really think about scaling. Um, 
But in order to do that, we needed to create better tools um, that made this technology something that everyone can use. So I encourage you to check out Potterware, which is a, um, something I've worked on for a number of years. It's basically a web-based slicing tool that allows non-technical users, people who have never used CAD before any 3D modeling, to go in and create their own beautiful complex object and then print it um, without needing any high-end computer equipment or anything like that. You just need access to a printer um, of which there are now quite a number of ceramic printers. Um, and this was a, a com compelling study because we discovered not only do students quickly engage with and begin creating exciting, interesting objects, um, you can also use a wide range of materials and the software has proven to be robust enough to handle that. So on the left here, you see part one of our Mud Frontiers project in which uh, students from both sides of the US-Mexico border in Juarez, El Paso, um, collected local earth and used our tools to 3D print their own designs. Um, and I just found it compelling that not only was there uh, functionality for a wide range of material, but also functionality for a wide range of aesthetics and design interests. Um, so of course, in doing so, we also couldn't resist scaling a bit, creating our first large scale earthen print uh, inside, but also it was created with local earth uh, from outside in the Texas desert here. Um, quickly, we, we had to leave the building. Um, and so a few months later, we began printing in the field, literally, um, using also locally sourced earthen mixes. Um, the one thing I'll say here is that the, the easiest way to to do large scale earthen material is to, or earthen printing is to begin with the material itself. So you just, you look around the world and you find a place where there's large buildings made out of earth and then you know the mud there is probably pretty good. And so you can just take your printer and start talking to people about what their ideal mix is and then find ways to calibrate it to your robotic system, which is what we've done here. Um, the results of this first set of work were a series of objects the beginnings of which were rather crude and they, they developed into, into uh, buildings that have some serious function. We made a stair and a small enclosure where people can sit and eat and, and share the warmth of a fire. Um, and um, we can see that this is a pretty uh, rustic process. We're not, we're not uh, 3D printing with AI on the moon, um, but we are engaging what we consider to be necessary technology. So. We're in the field, we have a very lightweight uh, robotic arm that's a, a SCARA robot, which means it's a, a three axis robot that prints with uh, polar coordinates. So it can make an object that is much larger than itself, which is a, a pretty important note here. It means that we can take a, a printer that can literally be picked up by one person and moved around and create a 10 ton earthen structure. Um, here you can see we're, we're supporting our, we're doing some hose management with uh, local infrastructure, a tractor, um, and mixing material on site. The material itself was dug in the field right behind um, these images. You can see our first stair, our first attempt at a door. Um, we began experimenting with a few things like uh, decreasing layer height relative to uh, slope in a dome structure to uh, improve layer to layer adhesion, which a number of people do at different scales and different materials. Um, the one thing I will say about this is it looks rather low tech, but of course this whole system is controlled uh, via Wi-Fi from uh, a number of devices. So you can have one person on their phone, one person on a tablet, another person on a computer, and you can seamlessly transition between who's shoveling mud and who's controlling the machine because it's live on multiple devices at once. Um, so we do quite a bit of work on the on the software end to make sure that we can handle the variability of material and pause whenever we want, go back in the print whenever we want, scale things a little bit for dealing with a really hot day where there's shrinkage. Um, so here you can see the most recent result of this work, uh, a three-part structure made during COVID last summer um, with a, a space for sleeping, eating, and bathing. Um, I'm sure you'll see more pictures of this soon. The interior is not quite complete yet. Um, and it was, a, it was an interesting experience to really just commit to working on site and actually 
just saying, all right, we're going to do this entire thing right here, regardless of the weather with the material we can dig out of the ditch next to our site. Um, you have to handle things like ambient humidity, uh, which slows drying time of the earth. You have to handle when it actually starts raining. You know, can your structure handle the added weight without buckling? Uh, ours did not fall down, luckily, but uh, we did suffer a few rainstorms. Um, believe it or not, mosquitoes were probably the most challenging factor of this whole project because it would rain and we were in the middle of a cow pasture. So then we would be attacked by mosquitoes and had to engage some great local technology of burning cow dung to scare them away, which proved to be very effective. Uh, <laughs> and um, on the actual printing side, we of course have to deal with a number of issues like, well, we didn't want to bring anything to the site. So we just used local gravel for foundation. And so despite uh, consolidating it as much as possible, you do get some differential settlement. You have to handle the way the structures shrink relative to the, uh, you know, solar gain. Um, of course, one side dries faster than the other because of the sun. And so this is something that we started to account for in our models, um, which I can talk more about if people have questions. And then of course you get mechanical issues when you're trying to print in a, in a windy thunderstorm. Um, but I'm happy to say that we've reduced the system to the point where it's actually largely quite effective in almost any weather um, because you don't have a million extremely expensive sensors on the verge of uh, failure at any given moment. Um, so you can see here some of our, our uh, very advanced technology. We wanted to expand the reach of our machine. So we, we purchased a, um, a uh, relatively high precision fourth axis rail from the local hardware store. This is made from plywood and two by fours, giving us the ability to set the machine in three positions and print about 60 centimeters at a time on each structure and then move to the next structure, um, which really sped up our print time. So what you see here, in the image on the left is about um, one, one afternoon's printing on a day that wasn't super hot. So we couldn't print as fast as possible, but we were able to get a decent amount done in a day. Um, and interestingly, this, this quantity of, of kind of wall construction is very similar to what you see in uh, earth and brick construction, because you, you typically only uh, stack bricks to the point where you start getting a lot of compression in the mortar um, with, with Adobe buildings. And so we're actually in a similar, similar rhythm of construction to the, uh, the, the traditional methodology. Um, so of course, we also couldn't resist experimenting a bit with integrating furniture into our tool pathing. Um, one nice thing about using local material is it's very cheap. So it's okay to make dense objects. Um, we also began exploring, can we integrate uh, sort of vernacular lintel technology into our structure? Uh, so here you can see we have a, a local piece of cedar placed inside the wall, um, connecting two of our structures here. Uh, of course, you have to program the machine to pause in the correct moment um, without sending mud everywhere um, to place these, which was a, a interesting experiment in toolpathing. Um, so, um, oh, go back one. So we did all this work, um, but a question that I'm always faced with when I look at the kind of current state of 3D printing buildings in the world, is what about the roof? Um, we've seen a few projects that start to handle this effectively, but more often than not, you see buildings like this, this um, sort of terrible thing by the US Army where not only did they only print walls, they, only, they, they also had to do it inside another superstructure with a conventionally constructed roof and a conventionally constructed foundation. To me, this is sort of the kind of thing we're trying to avoid. Um, at least here, they made something really beautiful um, with CLS. Um, but again, they, they're facing this issue of how do we enclose the structure? Um, and so uh, in my own research and with my students, um, I've been exploring uh, ideas of covering a structure without needing form work um, purely through geometry and clever tool paths. Um, and we're seeing more of this now. Um, of course, much of it is inspired by Hassan Fati, the Egyptian architect who revitalized some of these um, earthen construction techniques uh, that were created in parts of the world where there's not readily available timber. So of course, local masons came up with clever solutions to um, building 
roof structures without formwork by angling the courses of, of brick. Um, so here I'll show a couple of our experiments. Some of this work was a bit cut short by COVID, but um, even using a three axis machine, you can achieve pretty steep angles up to a one to 10 scale. Um, currently my research is building up to, a, to full scale construction with earthen materials, um, particularly in this realm of the squinch dome, which you see in the middle image. Um, and also building uh, the kind of structural analysis tools we need and the optimization tools we need to really uh, validate some of this work. So you see a typ typical buckling failure here and some beginnings of simulation that takes into account issues of delamination. Um, I unfortunately can't talk too much about this yet because we're in the process of publishing, but I'm happy to, to talk shop if anyone has questions. Um, so of course, uh, the long-term goal is is integrating this, this powerful thing we get from 3D printing, which is geometric freedom and really uh, careful attenuation of surface and texture at a minimal cost, right? Like you can make a smooth object and a varied object um, for similar amounts of money and similar amounts of material and similar amounts of time, which is not true in many conventional construction methodologies. So taking that and combining it with uh, you know, this vernacular knowledge of earthen construction all over the world and creating highly functional enclosed structures. So I will leave it there. Thank you so much. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Very interesting to see. Um, yeah, so so my uh, my initial question is you, you talked a little bit about uh, the not having uh, expensive uh, sensors. Um, uh, but do, do you have uh, uh, a, a sort of a goal for um, achieving a certain degree of automation or are you more looking into the, yeah, what is possible with uh, uh, 3D printing uh, rammed earth? So I would say um, uh, on a personal level, I'm very interested in integrating more automation, um, but from a, a as pragmatic a standpoint as possible, right? So if you if you look at a tractor, right, it's a great tool and it has a few really useful sensors. Like it tells you when it's almost out of gas, right? To me, that kind of sensing is very compelling and very applicable across the board. Um, and I think there is some potential for that here, of course, and we see it in, in many large scale concrete printing projects. Um, but I often question what what is going to be the most useful set of sensing tools? Like, do we sense differential settlement? Do we sense, uh, uh, you know, the water content of the earth that's a few layers down? And what I've been finding is that a lot of this can actually be like integrated into the software end. So where I'm focused is building really good tool pathing software that can take some input material parameters because the problem is the material is always different. So all of these examples we showed, we had to adjust the mix, right? And the reason it was possible to make these things is because as a team, we have broad material knowledge of earth. So I've, I've worked as a glaze chemist and in a tile factory, you know, Ron Real grew up building earthen buildings from Adobe brick. My colleague Logman is from Sudan, where he grew up uh, working in a different earthen con construction methodology. So we had a lot of knowledge on, you know, okay, how much straw do we add to this earth, right? And so finding ways to actually calibrate that and creating standards to test for that, I think will do a lot more for the progress of this work than necessarily building, building in onboard sensing. So if we can really take on the, the material properties at the beginning of a project and say, okay, this is how this works, bring it into the model, I think we'll see a lot of improvements. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, and uh, maybe maybe I'm uh, trying to make the connection uh, too much with the the, the previous speaker, but uh, I think you're both on on on. Uh, although it's seemingly very far uh, off uh, on the spectrum of uh, of three D printing uh, on Earth in a very simplest manner and and on space uh, very high tech. Um, but 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 in in uh, when I see uh, your type of printing and the uh, the way you think out of solutions, keeping it simple, uh, finding pragmatic software solutions uh, to solve these kind of problems, 
do you see any of your uh, innovations uh, uh, finding an application in, in uh, yeah, building structures uh, in, in space? I mean, absolutely. I think I, I'm certainly one of those people who dreams of, of getting to uh, design structures for space. And I think, you know, it's a, uh, there is an obvious connection because on space, we're not going to bring all the material we need to build something, right? That would be crazy. Um, and you also need, uh, especially on the moon, you need a ton of radiation shielding, which requires just a ton of material. And so obviously we're going to have to do something with lunar regolith, right? Um, as we saw on the previous presentation. And so I think that's why, that's in part why I have so much interest in, in building out really intelligent software tools that are really focused on material. So understanding how to build, you know, uh, like layer adhesion and, and these kind of binding properties into a model that looks at the delamination between layers, all that kind of thing, I find really compelling for the future because, um, you know, the earth itself is an amazing test bed for building up the material knowledge and the material flexibility we need to make this technology, like kind of as good as the shovel, like I was saying, right? Like right now, printing systems are, are for the most part, very specific. You need a really good mix. If the mix isn't dialed in. You just get this giant mess. Um, and so, you know, but if you have five guys with some knowledge of the mud, they can build anything with their hands, right? Um, and so I think it's finding some software that bridges that gap. Nice, thanks. So uh, a question from the audience, uh, Dr. Nestle, uh, he has a question uh, whether, uh, uh, yeah, if you can explain a bit what the differences in material properties and, and, and behavior of the, the earthen materials and uh, cement, cement sure. materials are. So, um, so generally speaking, um, I'll, I'll set rammed earth aside for a minute because that's a bit different. This isn't this isn't compressed earth we're we're printing with, but uh, generally speaking, the structures we're making and most earthen buildings. Uh, oh, I should really know what it is in in uh, metric units, but it's it can withstand about three hundred pounds per square inch of loading, which is quite a decent amount when it's dry. Um, and as you saw in the very first slide, you know there are ten story structures on Earth that are made entirely from local. Uh, soil. Um, so I would say that strength is less the issue. Um, the issue is that you can't, you can't reinforce earth in quite the same way as some of these cementitious materials. So when you see these 3D printed concrete projects, where, where I get excited about them is, is watching how like the full, the full range of, of concrete building technology gets implemented in a 3D printing system where you start to integrate rebar and integrate um, that sort of thing. So I would say that's a major difference. Um, the other huge upside of printing with earth over cement is that it doesn't destroy your equipment. Um, you know, if, if something goes wrong, there's a big thunderstorm and you have to go inside. Like when you come out, your gazillions of dollars of equipment isn't, isn't done for because you left some cement cure. Um, and on a similar note, I actually see that as a huge advantage because uh, obviously one of the really big problems of, of concrete construction is the life cycle of the material and the life cycle of the buildings. Most buildings made out of concrete, they're not, they're not built to exist for more than 50 or maybe a hundred years, uh, but the material will be really difficult to manage for far beyond that. Whereas with earthen construction, you know, there are structures that are a thousand years old that are still standing, but if we want to, we can dismantle them relatively easily without a huge impact on the environment. And so I think, if we be more realistic about what the life cycle of the buildings we make actually is, earth becomes a super compelling material. All right, so um, last question from uh, Dr. Nessel. He uh, maybe it becomes less compelling uh, than, uh, uh, but his question is, uh, do you need or think about using uh, additives or conditioners that make uh, earth printing easier? Yes, yeah, so that's, that's what a lot of my, uh, my current research kind of gets into because there's, you know, there are some, uh, some modern material science uh, kind of things we can do to our material that are not horrible for the environment and not uh, hugely 
material intensive that can really improve the strength. So um, of course, right now, the main add, the main additive to this material is straw, um, which is a traditional additive, though people often misunderstand its function. It's, it's not to add strength. It's actually to wick moisture out of the wall structure more evenly. So you get less cracking um, and more even shrinkage as the building dries. Um, but yeah, I think a lot about what we can put into the mud to make it a little stronger, a little more capable of, you know, sloping, sloping structures, uh, ways to minimize water content, right? Um, and there's a lot of transferable technology from especially industrial ceramics that we can think about here. All right, thanks. So uh, that uh, concludes, uh, I think, uh, all the sessions of today. Um, Oliver, do you wanna yep. pick up from here? Yeah, guys, thank you very much. And thank you very much, uh, Kiara and Sandy, for this very impressive talks. Um, yeah, uh, what are the plans now? Um, if you look at our schedule, then you'll see that uh, we, we were planning to have a round table from four to five. We are a little bit late, uh, but I think we still have time to do an experiment with all of you. Um, we have an audience of currently uh, 67 people and uh, we would like to activate you a little bit after uh, yeah, being the audience for, for the full day. Um, you can become active part of the next uh, 30 minutes and uh, Philip Rosenda will explain what we would like to do now. All right, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a little bit an interactive session on a so-called Miro board. Miro, I'll post the link in the chat. Um, you go ahead and explore this. You wanna open this in your browser and I'll share my screen to introduce it to you guys while you find your way over there. Let me see where it is. Uh, in Myra, we have a few different boards. So this is our poster that we have for this meeting. I can show our schedule here. And then we're prepared for different kind of topics that we would like to discuss with you guys. Those are these four different cards that we've shown here. So Sebastian will open four different breakout rooms that you are free to choose anyone that you like. And for each of those four breakout rooms, we have one of these cards um, where we are gonna be working on together. First breakout room, first session will be dealing or thinking about the future of construction. Then we have key challenges for additive manufacturing in the built environment. Then we want to collect a few current best practices and lighthouse projects. And we have one session that will think about the future of research and visions where we're going to go with this technology, obviously with um, the building environment in mind. How are we going to do this? Um, well, we've prepared, I'm going to show this at um, this one over here. We've prepared a, a few sticky notes. So the moment you get into your room, your host will introduce the topic maybe a little bit, and then we can work on these boards together by copying sticky notes with control C and control V. You can copy these on to any place on the board. We can move them, we can resize them, and we can add our text here, text and thoughts. And with these thoughts, we would like to fill in the different categories that we've prepared um, and create a little bit like a swarm intelligence um, kind of uh, collection of our thoughts here. I hope this will work for everyone. I see the board is already filling up. We got a few people over here. I think we can give a few minutes um, for everyone to find the way into the Myra board. Um, checking real quick. Is there any more questions in Zoom? I'll probably also post this for YouTube. Um, 
try to put it in the YouTube stream so anyone who's I already in, put it there can join as well. Oh, Sebastian, Bastian, you already did. Thanks a lot. Uh, then shall I open the breakout rooms? Yes, please. Okay, so I hope um, there should be popping something out now for mm -hmm. you guys. Now you're supposed to pick one of these and jump into these breakout rooms. Yes. Yeah. And Thank off you. I am. Where, where do I see the breakout rooms, Bastian? That should have been a. Ah, okay. Pop up window or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. For those who don't see it, you have these three dots and the more on the bottom of, of the Zoom screen. And uh, there you find the breakout sessions. Yeah. And then you, you have to click on join next to the, the name. So acoustically, we will be separated into these uh, four breakout rooms. But then in terms of graphic activity, we will flock all together on the mirror board. Um, let's see what happens now. Bastian, I have troubles finding the breakout room. Yeah, same here. Um, again, maybe you have to go in your uh, bottom bottom uh, symbol bar, and there should be next to your reactions and stuff like that. There should be more. On the right of my reactions, it's empty. Yeah, same here. Have you assigned to the Assigned to. Maybe I can try that. Yeah, I mean, I could also. Can you then just. Okay, I will. Okay. Um, that's Chris. Um, Philip, you are in research and visions, yeah? Right. Yeah, um, I've just
themselves. Bastian, did you did you close the breakout rooms? Yes, they could be closed, or they may be closing. Should be closed. <laughs> At least it took me back. Maybe it takes some time till the till Zoom reassigns everyone. I don't know how it's possible that still people are in the rooms. I got a message that it crashed um, for some, but I don't know if this is an internet problem or not. Yeah, weird. Um, thing is, I cannot even. I try to close again. Oh. Okay, back and forth. I guess that most people uh, were kicked out, so probably this is who's left. We have lost. Uh, we have lost one of our hosts. Fully, fully is gone. Fully is gone. Uh, <laughs> can I, I as well. I got a message that it was. Uh, Cutting all the time, and where some were kicked out. Yeah, yeah. But it's an experiment, also. I mean, I see Uli on the Miro board. Um, maybe Philip, can you make a big uh, invite for? Maybe you copy the link on the Miro board to invite everyone back. Yeah. To let them know. That it's closed. Do we, do we have the link for the for the Zoom session? Yeah. Yeah, definitely an experience. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I mean, it looked like on on the mirror board, it really looked cool. Yeah, like all these colored uh, dots and I like. I, I found it kind of remarkable how you organize things sort of through time, like like long-term goals and shorter term, what's going to happen next. But there's a lot of the same things in both. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe indicative of the kind of people who are working on the board, like some are practical, some are, you know, let's build on the moon now. But <laughs> it's going to be interesting to see what actually happens. It's, it's, it's slightly overwhelming, I have to say, to be on all these... Uh, channels active yeah okay uli is back and let me see we have around 30 people on youtube as well So I guess it's time yep. for a conclusion, yeah? Yep. Uli is muted. Can you unmute him? Uli, you are host again. You can unmute. Okay, it works. Very good. So, so everybody, how did the experiment work? <laughs> so and so, yeah? But it was fun. Yeah? So, so, so and so, that's uh, the right one. I was in a uh, in an, uh, in an, uh, breakout room where uh, there was only one person able to talk to me and the others were kind of um, off <laughs> and it was super silent for half an hour, a bit weird. 
and they started talking and you feel like, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone was busy on the Miro board. Yeah, the Miro board was actually super active and it's still active. And there's still people um, there. Um, Philip, Oliver, you're supposed to be here now. We are, we are, totally, we are totally back now. Um, <laughs> trying to remove the return to the main session banner. Yeah, well, uh, thank you to everybody to, to join this experiment. Uh, we lost quite a few people here. Um, but uh, if it's possible, we could have a 30 second wrap up of what happened on the boards. Uh, Chris, do you want to start? 30 seconds, 30 seconds. Yeah, okay. Um, first of all, thanks everyone for this nice experiment. Um, yeah, we have some interesting looks towards the future materials, so uh, functionally grading materials, which sounds really interesting. Um, again, this theme of multiple material uh, 3D printing came up. So when we look at our buildings, it's not just concrete or steel, but we have a whole puzzle of different materials. So we can see how we can combine materials. Um, the future applications, yeah, uh, it was not so much, but um, I guess it was this experiment. Um, it's interesting to see the future process is towards yeah this large scale printing and more precise printing and then also looking at like these uh, mini robots or mini bots and small robots building larger structures and then also looking at future education so like again in the future when 3d when 3d printing becomes more common at home and it becomes more taken for granted from what I understood. Um, this technology will become more hmm, known to us, but and then we still have to think about, okay, how's our education actually going to change to adopt this um, um, technology? Okay. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, yeah so it, it, it was a very quick um, wrap up. And That's me. we have Uli. That's me. Yeah, when I wrap, wrap it together, it's uh, uh, the architect's uh, job um, for uh, um, future challenges is uh, design function and tools for the design. Uh, the engineer's uh, job to wrap it up toge together is uh, um, uh, in a universal file format. <laughs> I find that interesting. That's uh, an, a challenge. Uh, lots of material um, uh, parameters, uh, microstructures, uh, anisotropy, which are say challenges within this material, but also regulations. Obviously, at some point, say uh, regulation systems for the built environment will have to appear. And for the construction, less labor on site. Um, on site construction seems to be something where we uh, all believe this is uh, going to um, it's going to be a challenge, a future challenge. Interesting wise, because uh, with additive manufacturing, we always thought this is on site, but we now, as we saw today. Most of the projects, not all, but most of the projects are somehow in a, in a lab, which are then to be transported. And then uh, less T CO2 with, um, with transport. We see a lot of arguments coming by, um, uh, by engineers saying we, we use less material, but uh, especially heavy material, they also have a lot of embodied energy by transport on long distances. And that's something where I think uh, CO2 um, is an aspect which could be um, taken seriously into focus. This is it. Thank you, Uli. Yeah, um, we looked at, uh, we tried to look at current best practice and future lighthouse projects, um, uh, but we started to look at the Eiffel Tower um, because when the Eiffel Tower was built, uh, there was a new material, there were new design tools like the graphic statics, there were requirements for new building typologies like large spanning halls for railway stations or radio towers like the tour, the Eiffel Tower. It came with new aesthetics, which was also puzzling for a lot of people. And uh, I see some parallels here when we look at 3D printing. There are very ugly objects uh, on the first glance, but maybe that means we have to get used to a different aesthetics. Um, we see there are new tools coming up that treat geometry not as a surface representation, but as a volume uh, broken down into voxels. And every voxel could have different properties, um, we see that things become 
um, competitive in terms of economy, like these three printed facade notes um, that, that is almost comparable to if you would mill it. Um, we see, we see uh, um, a 3D printed hand that is replacing the hands, the, the actual hands or prosthesis. Um, that's maybe not architecture, but it comes close to architecture. If you look, we look at the right hand side, we see fashion from Iris van Herpen that um, somehow blurs ideas of architecture and, and closing. Um, and maybe these boundaries will blur in the future as well. Thank you. Thanks, Oliver. And then to wrap this up, we have a quick look at future and uh, visions for this technology you, you, you as the, the next steps that are imminent. We have multi-laser selective laser melting. That's maybe not so relevant for the building industry, but for mechanical engineering, it for sure is. Um, we'll probably develop material standards, open source standards. Uh, we'll have better process control and better computational frameworks that also include augmented reality uh, and so on. Key players that we've collected, well, they're pretty obvious. They were pretty much all here today. I think that list is not complete but the best we could come up with. Um, bigger advances that we expect are something that, um, something like assemblies using microbots, um, maybe using support materials for concrete, cementic, or earthen printing, or things like real-time simulations of the printing process while the process is actually going on. And then we also have obviously organic binders for earth materials, which, which um, manifests in a, in a big advance and commercially available concrete printers for sure too. Um, a few wishes for 2020. There's the moon base again, the 3D printed moon base. We have self-assembling building, again, real-time simulation on a real-time and simultaneous design and printing. Um, then uh, we wish for that we can rent 3D printers for houses like cranes. Uh, and people want to build their own walls, kitchens, spaces, uh, potentially with functionally graded materials. Thanks everyone for this good overview. Um, quite interesting thoughts on this board. It was very quick, still gathered quite some information. Um, and I think it was an experiment worth, worth trying. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Philip, for organizing that. And uh, we now come to the end of this uh, great event. Um, we, we had one like overarching topic, one could say, um, which is the integration. Uh, the integration of uh, 3D printing or additive manufacturing into larger contexts, into um, into, the, the, into larger uh, process change from design to materialization, uh, but also the integration of um, 3D printing into existing constructions. Uh, we saw Ines Ariza that tries to work with repetitive industrialized uh, elements that are then like, like almost in a surgery welded uh, together. So it's a combination uh, of two different paradigms, uh, industrial repetition and then customization through 3D printing. Uh, we saw Philip Yuan's um, idea of, of having hybrid materials, of, of bringing different materials together. Um, we saw uh, Sandy Kurt that, that works with low-tech materials with very robust tools um, yeah, to make this technology available um, to much more people than, than uh, that use them today. Um, so we see that um, we see 3D printing maturing, so to say. And if I look back to the last six years of the BEAM Symposium, then, then we really started with isolating objects being printed and tested. And we now see that, um, well, this technology uh, starts to integrate into many different fields. And I think that's exciting. I'm looking forward for uh, next year's BEAM Symposium. Um, I hope you will all be back. 
Um, but at the very end of this day, uh, I would like to thank, first of all, uh, all our speakers who did amazing talks today. Thank you very much. Uh, all our exhibitors who were sending videos uh, that we would uh, watch over the lunch break. Uh, the moderators, Roland and Heis, thank you for uh, contributing to uh, the discussions. Um, I want to thank Form Next, who is our collaborator, Sascha Wenzler, Anja and Ritzi and Maria Besser, a great team that we love to work with. Um, I want to thank the people from the TU Darmstadt, and that is first of all uh, Bastian Wibranek for organizing this thing. Uh, Bastian, you did a great job. Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, but also Philipp Rosendahl, Chris Borg, Constanzi, um, that uh, were helpful to bringing people together, um, to, to finding people who, who, who are open to share their knowledge with us. Uh, Yvonne Machlaert for administrating the whole thing, Lara Maria Müncher, who did the layout for the booklet. Uh, we were supported by the TU Darmstadt profile area from material to product. Um, and uh, last but not least, uh, it's always a pleasure, dear Uli Knag, uh, <laughs> to work with you. Uh, you. Always fun. <laughs> Um, and uh, let's go for 2021 and then hopefully in Frankfurt as a physical meeting on the next form. Uh, I think it's going to be a hybrid one. I'm really, I'm really um, interested in getting this hybrid uh, thing running because we had so many people from other places which would not be able to join just a physical. So we really have to work to get the, the hybrid, um, hybrid one working. And Oliver, I fully, uh, fully, uh, I can't add something. Okay. Perfect. And that's it. Thank you very much to the audience for joining us today and uh, see you next year. Sandy, you if all. you still hear me, yeah. very cool yeah. work you do. Really cool. Really uh, appreciate it. I, I didn't have it on the screen that much. Uh, Chris was addressing it already, but I really, I really liked it. Very good work. Super Thanks. Cool. Yeah, we're. I wish I could show more of some of the technical details. I'm, I'm working on publishing a few things that. Yeah, well, get into... uh, if they're published, I'd like to see uh, the results. I'll, I'll send them your way. Yeah, please. Okay. Thank you all. Hey. Bye. Bye, everybody. And Bastian, thanks for all the work. Super cool. Yeah. Well done. Man. Fun. It was a fun day. Yeah. Yeah, it was a fun day. Wow. Well, and intensive. <laughs> and sometimes yeah. a bit stressful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So thanks again for the chance to organize that here. Now, yeah. You're very welcome, man. Okay. Okay. Bye. Good. Bye. Bye, Oli. Bye, Chris. And bye to everyone. <laughs>